our tithes and offerings, so um, just be mindful of the many gifts that we've received, and God just asked for a little bit back in return, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bounty of blessings you've given us in our life. We ask that you take our gifts that we return to you, use them to multiply your kingdom, both here at this church, across the churches in the United States, and across the global church and the world. Of course, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. scripture this morning is from Luke chapter 9, verses 28 through 36, the transfiguration. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. The word of God for the people of God. Our text for today's sermon tells the story of Peter, John, and James having a mountaintop experience with Jesus Christ. They are amazed but not quite sure of what to do with their experience, which is not too different from our own context when sometimes we too are at the mountain and don't know what to say or do about it. 
Over the next few minutes, we'll take a look at the book of Luke. Then we'll delve specifically into the verses of 9, 28 to 36. Then we'll try to make sense of this lesson in our own life, seeing how we apply the text into our everyday lives. Throughout the sermon, I pray that you will experience God in some way or in some fashion, and that you will hear the good news of Scripture. Please join me in prayer. Lord, I pray that my words will be your words today, and that each person will hear what they need, either from Scripture, from sermon, from songs, or from conversation with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we've been in the book of Luke, but allow me to catch everybody up so we're on the same page. It's the third book of the New Testament, as well as the third book of the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke summarize and tell the story of Jesus Christ while on earth. Thus, they're called the Synoptic Gospels by theologians who strive to find other words to use for things that what you and I call. That way they feel smart. <laughs> Luke's name is not mentioned in the book, as is the case of many other books in the Bible. Yet scholars believe that Luke wrote this book as well as the book of Acts. Both books are written to and for an individual named Theophilus, who was likely the person who was funding Luke for the writing of the letter and the distribution of it. He served it as publisher. Luke was most likely a Gentile. He was trained as a physician and very knowledgeable about Greek culture and Greek language. He accompanied Paul on his second missionary journey at various times. And the book of Luke was most likely written somewhere around 59 to 63 AD, or maybe just a little later in the 70s or 80s, and most likely from the city of Rome. Its purpose is to give strength to the Gentile Christian church who were being persecuted and attacked by unbelievers. Imagine this is just, you know, a generation or so after Jesus. And stories were going around circulating uh, that are incorrect about Jesus. And Luke's letters are meant to correct the ill-founded reports. Luke wanted to show the place that Gentile believers have in the kingdom of God based on the teachings of Jesus. He wanted the whole world to hear and know the gospel, to know that God is love, that Jesus was God's son and that he died for our sins and that we are forgiven and loved people. This is the good news of the gospel. If you look at the text leading up to our text today, uh, you'll see different headings applied to the various stories that are going on at the time. Well, you'd see that uh, Jesus and John the Baptist is the title of one area. The parable of the sower. Jesus calms a storm. Jesus sends out the twelve. And Jesus feeds the five thousand. This is like a busy concert series of a, as a major musical act of today. Every day, a different city. A different place to stay. A different place to eat. And with every human encounter, there was a teaching moment. And thus we have the collection of lessons and stories recorded by Luke, as well as Matthew and Mark. In verses 28 to 36, we find the narrative of Christ's transfiguration. Which means Jesus went from his human being form to a divine form. His face changed. His clothes, clothes became bright bright light like a flash of lightning and this occurs while Peter John and James are up on the mountaintop praying with Jesus imagine what it might have been like it's been a day of teaching and healing and caring for people and you come to your place where you're going to sleep for the night and Jesus calls you over Psst, come on let's go up to the mountaintop for some quiet time and rejuvenation so they began to walk up the mountain, not down the path to the next village, not down another path to where the water spring was, but up the mountain. Now, I wonder what was going through the disciples' mind. I mean, we don't know. It doesn't say. There's not a little excerpt. I wish there was sometimes. 
But I wonder if they knew that this was going to be a special time with their rabbi. I mean, once up on the mountain, Jesus begins to pray, and this countenance of him changes, and his face is altered, and his clothes shine brightly. It is then that the three disciples see Moses and Elijah in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus, some kind of holy huddle or a powerful powwow of the three. Then they hear them talking about the departure of Jesus, which must occur before Jesus' fulfillment in Jerusalem, meaning his death and resurrection. In this moment, we see that our Lord was willing to be in conversation about his own suffering and death and <coughs> offer himself as an atonement for our sin. At that time, the text says the disciples were very sleepy. I can see how that might happen. They've been traveling. They've been learning. They've been having these mind-blowing conversations that have really taken them outside of their own context and made them think about a new world, a new way of being with this guy named Jesus leading them. They were in deep need of some downtime for their minds and body to recuperate. They were tired both physically and mentally, and in the midst of their tiredness, they see the glory of the Lord and two standing with him. Peter speaks up. Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. <clears throat> Think in our own context how we might, if we were there, have said, please come to my house. Let me make you some food. Let me give you some drink. Don't go home yet. It's a long drive. Stay the night with us. Yet Peter did not know what he was saying. I imagine he was simply following the hospitality of his culture, like we might be. Then the big cloud comes and overshadows them, and the three disciples become fear. Now think back in their context of this Old Testament that we read. And when a cloud appeared, there was God. <coughs> the cloud was associated with the presence of God for them. They would have been awestruck. They didn't have airplanes. They weren't flying through clouds going, look, puffy stuff like cotton candy. Uh -huh. This was an awestruck, <coughs> even fearful <coughs> moment for them. And then, in the midst of the cloud, they hear the voice of God. This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Now, does this mean that they weren't listening to Jesus before? I don't think so. I sense it was more of an additional validation, rising up Jesus from rabbi to savior status, from human to divine. God is saying, hey, pay attention here. I've got something to say. Listen to him. Listen to what he says. And remember, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus were just speaking about Jesus going to Jerusalem and having to suffer and die on the cross. And even though God has just validated this conversation in this holy huddle, some of the disciples are still about to question that as Jesus begins to talk more about it. That he has to go and meet with the authorities and suffer and die. As our scripture closes, this mountaintop experience was so profound that the three disciples kept it to themselves not telling others about their experience. Now, I can imagine that others maybe wouldn't have believed them. You know, if they were going to say it, they would have said, you're not going to believe what I'm about to say. Well, I tell you what, I'm just not going to say it. Or maybe they were so moved when they came down, they go, what happened? They were just like, I can't speak of it. So what do we do with this? As we consider how we might apply the scripture for today, I'd like to start by asking, when have you experienced a mountaintop experience in your life? One of those times where you felt a holy connection. Here are a few ways one might experience a mountaintop experience. You might actually climb to the top of a mountain. This is the top of a mountain in, in New Mexico, in the Santa de Cristo mountain range. It's called the Tooth of Time. It's at Boy Scout camp called Filma. And when I was a young man of about 16, we climbed up at night 
uh, got there, it was still dark, spent some time in our sleeping bags waiting for the sun to come up, and it looked something like this. It was a mountaintop experience to see the grandeur and the beauty and the color of creation. And then in 2012, Stacy and I had a chance to take this picture from Mount Sinai, where Moses had gone up to receive the 12 commandments and come, 10 commandments. Just listen, just make sure you listen. 15 commandments. How many did he get? 10. Do I hear 10? 10 commandments. Again, grandeur and beauty, majesty. Oh, wow. Looking at it as a mountaintop experience. Another way that you might experience a mountaintop and one that is much easier on your sleep schedule is sunset. I've seen many more sunsets than I've seen sunrises. <laughs> but, you know, I've seen sunsets while on the ocean, on the lakes and the hills, the desert overlooking the Dead Sea, the North Georgia Mountains near Helen, on the coast of Savannah, the skyline of Atlanta, and Haightville. This picture is the sun setting on the Mediterranean Sea at Caesarea. And one of my favorite places to watch a sunset is in the Virgin Islands. And like a sunrise, there are the beautiful colors and majesty where you get to see in God's creation in this beautiful, picturesque form. But mountaintop experiences come in many other ways as well. The birth of a baby. How about the cure of a deadly disease? Maybe just sensing the presence of God in a moment or in a space. Or how about hearing words when you really need them, like, I love you, or I forgive you. Maybe reading the scripture and having tears come down your eyes because you feel you are so close to the presence of God in that moment. We can have a mountaintop experience anytime and anywhere, for God is all around us. All it requires on our part is some acknowledgement, some awareness, our understanding, our acceptance to experience the mountaintop in the moment. But I've also heard it said that we don't live on the mountain. We live in the valley. And we travel the highways and byways of life that are so often filled with struggle. We meet God here as well, because God is with us all the time and everywhere. And as I think back and reflect and, and recall those close encounters of the godly kind, they are so more often in the valleys than on the mountaintop. It is when I am in doubt, when I'm afraid, and when I've given up, that I often feel the closest to God. One of these times that occurred this last Monday evening at the 2019 General Conference. That afternoon, the one church plan had been defeated, and there was a very gloomy mood amongst the American delegates and guests. I went to find some friends to huddle with. I knew there were some people there from UMKR, the United Methodist Kairos a response. These are the people who support the Palestinian Christians, and I've met them at other conferences. I connect with them on the phone. I was looking for a friendly huddle, somewhere where I could recuperate. Well, they had a table in a room at the Holiday Inn, a big room. There were several tables from other organizations, and the room was for a group called Link, Love Your Neighbor Coalition. This was a coalition of various groups from the United Methodist Church who were working on a way to of fully accepting the LGBTQ community. And as I sat around a table of eight or ten people processing the events of the day, I wrote the following words. The path with God is paved with surrender, unexpected outcomes, surprise, uncertainty, questions, and mystery. You know, if it was easy, we would turn from God. 
Yet our lament in moments like this is merely a precursor to our own joy. We can look at the Psalms in the Bible that speak to our human nature grappling with this relationship we have with God through struggle, through questions, through wrong turns, we become available to be used and shaped by God. When we are out of options and on our knees is when we are closest to the divine. Now this does not take away from our mountaintop experience, for these are times when we are close to God as well. What I was striving to express is this nature of the valley of despair and the mountaintop experience. God is in both, and we find ourselves feeling close to God in both situations. I was also verbalizing or trying to come to grips with, how is it that I spend more time in the valley than on the mountaintop? But that's okay. Again, we get to experience God in both situations, if we're listening and if we're in tune with God. This, too, is a part of the good news found in the Bible, in the whole Bible, the Old and the New Testament. That is that our God is a God of love who is always present and available to us. It's simply up to us to turn our face towards God and listen, <coughs> pray, accept, and surrender. Another way of stating it is in the words from 1 John 4. 14 to 16, and this is from the contemporary English version. God sent his son to be our savior for the world. We saw his son and are now telling others about him. God stays one with everyone who openly says that Jesus is the son of God. That's how we stay one with God and are sure that God loves us. God is love. If we keep on loving others, we stay one in our hearts with God and he will stay one with us. The good news was good yesterday, today, and it'll be good tomorrow. For I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons. Neither the present nor the future. Nor any powers. Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation. We are connected with God and one another with love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 If you will now turn to page 12 in the hymnal, we'll transition into our time of communion. United Methodist Church table. It's not a hate bill table. It's not my table. It is God's table. And it is open to anyone and everyone. Your only requirement is that you seek a closer relationship with God. During communion, if you'd like to come to the rail and pray, you'll be welcome. Also, any money left at the rail will go to Family Life Services. If you would, please, let's go to page 12. Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who honestly <clears throat> repent of their sins, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be in the leading church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. 
Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. Now on page 13. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to our Lord and God. It, it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, <clears throat> delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by the water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as all.